So it is my honor to welcome and introduce to you Dr. Mary Clark Michella. Dr. Michella pastored United Church of Christ congregations in Massachusetts for a number of years before receiving her PhD from Claremont School of Theology. For the past 20 years, she has served as a professor specializing in pastoral care and counseling. She has a heart and a particular understanding of immigrant populations evidenced in her many published works. She also has a background knowledge of prison ministry, having worked as an instructor in the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. Her willingness to enter into difficult topics while also maintaining the joy and grace found within those spaces is a hallmark of her teaching and her work and is especially relevant to hearing and tending to the stories that youth bring to our ministries, which is what she'll be speaking about today. Dr. Michelle, welcome. We are delighted to have you here. So good afternoon. It is a great joy to be here with you today. And I want to thank Skip Masbach for inviting me, and also Kelly Morrissey and Jill Olds um, for the work of organizing the event. And I want to thank all of you for being here and for caring so much about youth. The first point I want to make is that the work you all do in ministering to young persons is critically important. Having pastored churches and led a few youth groups myself in my day, I know it is difficult work. Now, more than ever, it takes creativity and energy and courage to mentor uh, and care for the next generation. They are careening into adulthood in an uncertain age, and they are faced with numerous challenges all at once. Not only are their bodies and brains growing and changing, some of their friends are acting strange, uh, and their parents, who once seemed to know everything, have suddenly become stupid. <laughs> Youth are also dealing with increased pressure from social media. Sharon Parks comments that young people are both more connected and more distracted than ever before. In addition to their fears about what their particular futures may hold, uh, whether they can get into and or afford to go to college, this generation is faced with the specter of the climate crisis and what it will mean for them living on this planet. In light of all these challenges and changes, who is there for them? To whom can they turn for guidance, nurture, wisdom? and understanding. Well, you are. You who organize car washes for mission trips or meet with young people on Sunday nights and order pizza and sometimes talk about Jesus. You who offer safe places where teenagers can let off steam after dealing with racism in the form of microaggressions or not so microaggressions. You who know that some of our youth are struggling with secrets and need a place to talk. You who spend time with them week after week and even when they've been absent for a long time still remember their names. By being there and seeing them in person, not just online, you are creating what Donald's, Donald Woods Winnicott called a holding environment for them. A holding environment is a place of safety and care where young people can be free to be themselves and know that they are accepted and loved without condition. And because you are a representative of the church, you are holding a space open in them for their awareness of God's presence and love. So as we talk today about the different ways in which pastoral skills might deepen your ministry. And as we practice some of these skills together, please know that your presence with the youth of your congregation and community is really the most important element of pastoral care. So today we're going to discuss a form of pastoral care that I am calling caring for stories. 
Now, the most basic element of caring for stories is, of course, listening, the practice of active listening. And the challenge with active listening is twofold. First, you need to pay close attention to what a person is telling you and how they are saying it. And second, you need to let the person know that you heard them and that you understood the gist of what they were telling you. So you can do this second part, you can't do this second part by simply saying, I understand. You tell someone a story and they say, I understand, what do you think? Nah, they don't get it, right? <laughs> so you have to say something that shows them that you get it. And you can do this by reflecting back the gist of the story and using some of the words of the person who told the story. So I'm going to ask you as we start out this afternoon to engage in a brief listening exercise with the people at your table. And you have a sheet in your packet called Listening Exercise 1. If you could turn to that now. We're going to need everyone to reflect for a moment on your name, all the parts of your name. Your first name, middle name, maybe a suffix, a junior. And you're going to tell the people at your table a brief story about your name. We're going to do it in 30 seconds. <laughs> no rush, but if you were to do this exercise with your youth group, you could give them more time. Um, and in this uh, 30 seconds, you're going to answer some of the questions listed there, such as, who named you? Um, uh, were you named after someone? Do you have a nickname? How do you feel about your name? Um, have you ever changed your name? And how do you like to be called? So we'll go around in the circle, and when one person shares, everyone else listens, but the person to your left will listen extra carefully because uh, that person to your left is going to tell you back what you said about your name out loud in front of the group, okay? <laughs> and after, if you're the second person, you're going to turn to the person whose story you just repeated and say, did I get that right? Um, and if you're, the listener did not get it right and you're the speaker, you may correct them. And if you're corrected, accept it graciously, okay? And say it back one more time to assure the person that you heard them this time, okay? And then the second person will become the speaker and so on around the group. And um, the uh, first person who spoke will recap the last person's story. Got it? Okay. So, <laughs> go for it. We have about 10 minutes total for this exercise. Because of time, Let's uh, come back together and just reflect on this exercise together a little bit. So um, my first question is, if, if you were someone who was able to tell your story and you heard um, your person next to you tell it back to you, how did that feel? Anyone? Yes. Okay, it feels good to have someone pay attention to you, right? And did your listener reflect accurately? Okay, great. Um, and those who were in the role of listening, uh, what was that like for you? Easy, difficult? Difficult, okay. What was difficult about it? Uh-huh, okay. Yes. Yes. Paying attention like that. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. 
Okay, so maybe you've had more practice, I don't know. But it is something you can learn with practice, but it is, I think, it takes concentration. And in our everyday exchanges with each other, we don't often um, give each other our full attention, right? So, um, so I think that is the, you know, a challenge of active listening, is to really try to pay attention and stay focused. Um, did you notice any commonalities uh, around the table as people were sharing their stories? No? You'll have very different names. Yes. <laughs> okay. Parents had personal investment in the naming of their child. Yes. Complicated names, yes. My kids are hyphenated, so they'd tell you all about it. Yes. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. It is in a, a part of your story. That is, it's really important. Sometimes people get a little emotional when they do this exercise, and you can't mess up. So that might be a good. <laughs> key for working with um, youth as well, to give them something that they can do and not worry so much about messing up. Okay, so um, let's move on a little bit now. And um, I want to tell you about another form of care that kind of goes along with active listening, once you practice that quite a bit. Um, it's it's uh, listening for stories, okay? Listening to stories approach. And it's also known in some circles as narrative pastoral care. And the, a the aim of this is to help young people tell their stories in a particular way, to tell their stories in ways that make them stronger. Um, and that phrase, telling our stories in ways that make us stronger, comes from the work of Barbara Wingard and Jane Lester in Australia. So um, this whole approach of story caring um, has some of its roots at, at a time in 1971 when a man named Stephen Kreitz, a Methodist minister and a professor of philosophy right here at Wesleyan University, wrote an essay called The Narrative Quality of Experience. And in it, he pointed out that we humans are a storytelling people. We depend on stories in order to understand ourselves and the world. And the stories that we tell also set the framework for how we live our lives. So surely this makes sense to Christian leaders who tell an old, old story and depend on biblical stories to communicate the faith. The particular stories we tell and hear influence not only what we believe, but how we live. Jesus was a storyteller himself, and he told parables, what we might call alternative stories, stories that challenge much of the current wisdom of his day. So we use stories to help us find our place in the world. Each of us has stories that are particular and unique to who we are, but our stories are never completely original. Our stories emerge in the incubator of culture. They are influenced by the stories our parents and families tell us and the stories that peers and social groups and churches impart. So we take in many stories knowingly or unknowingly through news media, through the arts and institutions. And we also tell stories, right? We tell stories about youth and adolescence, for example. And hopefully young people tell us their own stories. So my overall thesis for pastoral care with youth is that stories matter and that we need to encourage young people to tell their stories in ways that make them stronger. So let's start at a basic level. 
What is a story? Okay. A story consists of events linked in a sequence across time according to a plot. So imagine a picture of a starry sky. I have a real one this time. <laughs> Each star represents an event that happened in your life. There are so many events, right, that you can't tell them all. So we tend to remember perhaps the brighter stars, maybe the special days, right, when something important happened, or the terrible days, right, that made an impression on us, left memories behind. And we select the moments or the events that are important to us, and we link them together across time according to a plot. So this is I think I'll just use the pen. Okay. Now, um, the way we link the stars together is the plot. And plots usually have some underlying meaning. That's the meaning in the stories that we tell. Um, so, are you with me so far? All right, I'm going to give you an example. Um, how do we go about choosing which stories we tell, which experiences we remember when we tell our stories? Okay, we tend to choose memories and events that the people around us, our families, for example, remember and talk about. We also choose events that seem to fit the stories that we hear echoed by others in the larger culture around us. So here's an example. Suppose, just suppose, that you are a teenage girl and you say to yourself and to your parents when they, they are urging you to do your math homework, you say, I'm not very good at math. Where did you get this idea, right? Where did you get this story about yourself? Well, if I'm doing this correctly, there was a time, it's red, can you see that? Okay. There was a time in second grade when you failed your test in subtraction, and you remember that time, okay? You felt really bad about it. And then there was a time in fifth grade when you struggled to understand fractions. So let's say that's here. Right. And you made some kind of association between these two times, right? You hated fractions and you, you wanted to use a calculator, but they wouldn't let you take that to the test. And so once again, you got a, a disappointing grade. All right. Then you overheard your parents look at each other and say, she's not very good at math, right? So you remember that too, all right? And then when you were in seventh grade tackling more complicated equations, you heard someone say, girls aren't as good at math as boys are. So you tuck that away. And these things all seem to kind of go together and they make sense, right? And then when you um, got to high school, you decided to stay away from the complicated subjects altogether. You didn't go near trigonometry. And when you took your pre-SATs, your score in math was much lower than your verbal score. And so you remember that. All right. And linking all these ideas together, whoops. That line went astray. <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, we lose track of our thoughts. <laughs> you say to yourself, I just can't do math, right? It seems like a logical conclusion. The facts bear it out. You remember all of those times, and you're convinced that it's true. OK, now let's think about the starry sky. Remember that there are lots of stars out there besides just those five or six that we, that we have circled. So as, as someone asks you to tell more about your life and you think about it, you remember there was a time in first grade that you had kind of forgotten, and that was a time when you got 100% on a math test. That was addition. 
and you were really proud, and your teacher put the paper up on the board with a gold star on it. And um, uh, a, an older and wiser student, like someone in second grade, came and said, you know, it's good to be smart, but you don't want to be the smartest, because then the boys won't like you, right? You've heard this story, yes? So you also kind of remember that, right? That's also there in your memory. Um, and then you remember that there was a time in sixth grade when um, there was a girl in your class who was just constantly raising her hand, and she was clearly the smartest one about math in the class. So you also kind of tuck that memory away, that here was a girl who seemed to be uh, at least as, as smart as everyone else. And then, um, in high school, you didn't take trig, but you took geometry and you were pretty good at it. And um, you liked it and you did well. So you, you bring that back to your mind. And then, your test scores were a little disappointing when you took your pre-SATs. But you thought about it, and you decided you might handle it a little differently. You might, for example, contact that girl who did so well in sixth grade and ask her to help you study so you could do better on the SATs. So um, if you connect all of these events, you might tell a very different story about yourself than if you just remember the bottom ones, right? So often, um, our stories are uh, simple, like, oh, I'm not good at math. But if we thought more about all of the things that we could recall, they might be more complicated, OK? And richer, thicker, as we say, thicker and richer stories. And you can see how the stories that we hear about ourselves, maybe about our gender, maybe about our racial group, or our, our cultural heritage can affect the stories we tell ourselves and in turn limit or enhance the way we live our lives. Narrative pastoral care suggests that all of us have many stories that we have repeated and heard told many times so that we think they're the gospel truth. But in reality, our stories are more complicated and complex, like in a novel when a plot thickens and unfolds. So I want to proceed now by telling a couple of different stories about youth. One of them is a familiar story in our culture. It goes like this. Teenagers are impulsive, crazy people. Raising them will bring you to your knees. Maybe not a bad thing. They are driven by rampant hormones, causing them to lose their minds. Their frontal lobes are underdeveloped, and so they lack judgment. They are prone to addictions, depression, and mental illness. They are out of control, immature, and they need to grow up. Anybody ever heard this story? All right. It's a common story in our culture. It is a myth, but it is a reigning myth. And it can influence the way we parent, lead, or mentor youth groups. The story is a thin story. There isn't much to it. And though it sounds like it must be true, especially that scientific part about the frontal lobes, it is actually um, oversimplified, and it's a form of stereotyping. It's kind of like saying girls aren't good at math. The tricky thing is that we can all think of times when the evidence seemed to support this story. Okay, some teenagers do develop what we call a relationship with trouble. You can find some events that support the storyline, but we know that isn't the whole story about youth. So now I want to offer you a very different story about young people, and it goes like this. Adolescents are living through some of the most critical years of their lives. Their brains are developing and maturing. They can acquire skills and develop strength as never before. They're discovering themselves, their sexuality, their abilities, their needs, and challenges. They're longing for relationships with peers. They're starting to imagine their futures. They're searching for meaning, purpose, and faith. 
So here we have two very different stories about young people. And the stories we tell about them will influence how we treat them and how they live, how they act. Stories matter. There's a study in the science, social science literature um, that shows, for example, that when teachers were told that certain students had limited intelligence, those students performed poorly on their tests in school. Likewise, when the teachers were told that the same group of students was gifted and had exceptional intelligence, these same students showed marked improvement in their test scores. So I want us to unpack this second story a little bit so that it will take hold more than the other one, at least in this community of caregivers. I think that uh, psychiatrist Daniel Siegel, in his book, Brainstorm, The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain, would be in agreement with our second story. In describing what he calls the essence of adolescence, he claims that adolescence is an important stage of growth, an essential time of emotional intensity, social engagement, and creativity. The word brainstorm strikes me as particularly apt. If you think about a time when you were asked to brainstorm, say to come up with ideas for how to solve a problem, it usually involves sharing some ideas that you have, just uh, saying whatever pops into your mind in the moment. Some people call it popcorning. So the idea is to use your imagination and let a whole raft of ideas bubble up before deciding which ones would be worth trying. So the term brainstorm might suggest the emotional intensity of the teenage years on the one hand, but also their creative potential on the other. So according to Siegel, there are four main benefits slash challenges emerging during adolescence. I thought I got rid of that, sorry. And, um, these are features of thinking and feeling that emerge during these critical years and how we navigate them, uh, how each of us navigates these challenges as we're growing up will impact how we live our lives. And this is because our brains are setting down enduring patterns of thinking and feeling and thoughts that um, can affect the way we live our lives for a long time. So the features are um, novelty seeking, social engagement, emotional intensity, and creative exploration. Now if you think about these, each of them could have a positive side, an upside, and a downside. So the downsides, uh, say, of novelty seeking might be risk-taking and thrill-seeking behavior. Okay. Uh, the upside, however, would be that um, there's a capacity to engage passionately in a cause and the capacity to live with a sense of adventure. And these are things we would like to retain, really, uh, throughout our lives, right? Similarly, um, social engagement can have its downside if it means that um, our youth are isolated from adults and never uh, share important um, decision making with anyone but people their own age. The upside, however, is the development of supportive friendships. And this is, um, I believe, one of the most important aspects of any life well lived. Emotional intensity's downside might be excessive moodiness, impulsivity, and generally difficult to be around this. The upside is the experience of energy, drive, and emotional exuberance, qualities that are needed in order to excel at something or to just recognize the goodness and wonder of life. 
creative exploration is due to the brain's expanding capacities to reason. And um, the downside of this might be that a search for meaning could lead to a crisis of identity or um, vulnerability to peer pressure. But there are a lot of upsides, right, to an expanding ability to conceptualize the world and to ask larger questions. The upside is that the mind can hold more creative imagining and perceive the world in new ways. A new sense of purpose and possibility can take hold. So now I'd like to pause and show you a clip of a 16-year-old girl. And okay. And think about Greta Thunberg's um, talk in terms of some of the developing capacities that we just talked about. So did you notice any of them there? Um, what capacities did you see in her story? Anyone? Sorry? Emotional intensity. Yes, definitely. Energy, drive. Um, think about some of the others. Oops. Okay. Um, the capacity to understand concepts. She goes on to describe the climate crisis in great detail uh, with all of uh, the important facts at her fingertips, right? And she's bringing it to public awareness. And note also that she described her diagnoses, which were depression, Asperger's syndrome, which is at the mild end of the autism spectrum, OCD, and uh, that's obsessive compulsive disorder, and selective mutism, which means that she only speaks when she has something to say, right? And what, what I think is remarkable, besides the, the important message that she is conveying, is that she's telling a new story about some of her challenges and suggesting, for example, that autism and her kind of singular focus on the environment in the, in the context of a climate crisis is more sane and wise uh, than what is considered normal, okay, or business as usual to the rest of the world. So I think her story demonstrates, in a way, the critical importance of the adolescent years, and this being a time when people can identify their values and work passionately for a cause they, they believe in. And indeed, there are many other examples of local young people who are speaking out on uh, climate change. And uh, also, more generally, youth is Important, an important young time for many young people, perhaps even some in this room, he, who first became spiritually or politically aware in their teenage years. It's a time of conversion to, to faith for some, and a time of protest and caring for justice for others. So I want to show you one more film clip And this is of another individual, and her name is Bree Newsom.
Bree Newsom did this as a young adult at age 22. She said of the experience, and here I am quoting an interview with her cited by my colleague Almeida Wright. I was in an intense state of peace during the action. My activism is indeed informed by my faith in Jesus Christ, who was sent to set the oppressed free. I firmly believe that we are all children of God created equally. I consider myself to be following not only in the footsteps of freedom fighters, but also in the footsteps of the first Christians who often faced imprisonment in the course of spreading the gospel and acting upon the prophetic faith. So. Sorry. Yeah, those are her words. So in light of such strong positive examples of young people sharing their stories, and um, given these features of developing young minds, how can we encourage young people to tell and live better stories? Stories that <clears throat> can lean into the upside of their growing intelligence and ability to conceptualize the world. How can we help them to tell stories that will make them stronger. One of the things we want to do, of course, is offer youth opportunities to tell their stories, whether that involves speaking with you in a private moment or sharing in small groups with others present or in the church. In the time-honored tradition of giving testimony, it is important that youth get chances to speak and that they find a listening audience. We don't live and thrive and grow in isolation, do we? But in community, where we get to share our stories with attentive others. So youth need to share their stories, whether it's through spoken word poetry nights or in a retreat setting. As one author in Narrative Care puts it, they need membership in systems of love and support. There's one more exercise I want us to try today. And this one is one that I think can help uh, you help young people focus on their skills, their insights, and their values. And this is maybe a little bit different than what you might have learned in pastoral care courses. We have sometimes in the past focused more on problems or on the downsides of adolescent challenges. But now I want us to engage in a practice that might help reinscribe some new storylines following a new plot that emphasizes the abilities and values that young people are developing. And this involves telling a story about your skills and values. Um, so I want you to try this yourselves and then you can maybe think about taking it back with you and using it with youth. So for this exercise, we need to be kind of in pairs. So you need to turn to someone near you. And if you have an odd number of people, there can be three in one group. And in the pair, this is exercise two in your packet. Um, in the pair, we need one person to be the listener, and the, the inter, to be the interviewer, and one person to speak and share their story. And we're going to, uh, the interviewer is going to use the questions listed on exercise two, and not all of them necessarily, but choose some of them. They're different kinds of questions than you might usually consider pastoral care. Um, if you have to skip a few, that's okay, but try to include some of the ones at the bottom. And then we're going to talk about it together. So we're just going to have a one-way interview, and... I'm going to give you about uh, six minutes to practice this with someone nearby. Let's come back together as a group. <laughs> so
So what was it like uh, if you were speaking to answer um, these questions about one of your skills? What was it like to actually be interviewed about a skill? Yes. It felt good. Uh huh. <laughs> okay, it was validating. Yeah, a little shift in focus uh, in the conversation. Anyone else have an experience similar to that or different? Yes. You? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, yes. Yes. Well, I think you could ask, where did you get that idea, you know, and let them tell you both kind of the, the stories that led to that conclusion, and then to say, were there any times when you had a better experience? Yeah, let them tell you both stories. So, so about yeah. Yeah, don't try to change their minds because they have evidence, right? <laughs> so, but they also have other evidence and eventually you want to be able to unearth that forgotten, forgotten evidence. Okay. So, um, did any, what was it like uh, to be in the role of interviewing? Um, did anyone have a reflection on that? Again, it's a little bit different than traditional pastoral care. Yes. 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 Yes, and that's what makes this approach um, exciting, I think, because we genuinely don't know what the other person is going to say. They're, they're going to say something surprising, usually, and so we're learning, and that engages us. Um, yeah. All right. Um, and do these questions um, help you see the connection between the idea that stories not only reflect our lives, but also shape how we live? Okay, anyone get with that? Okay, all right. Well, thank you for engaging in that. I want to end somewhere near where I began today by stressing how vitally important your role is in caring for youth. Um, our youth are living through difficult times. They are connected and distracted. Um, they may be disheartened by the political scene or worried about their own well-being. But uh, caring for stories means listening to them and creating opportunities for them to tell their stories uh, out loud to each other, to you, to the whole congregation at times. It means asking the kinds of questions that will help them reflect on their developing strengths and their values, as well as their hopes for the future. When they share these stories with you and each other, they're doing the work of imagining and shaping their own lives. Um, your youth will begin to imagine themselves and their purpose in the world in new ways, and who knows where that will lead? We don't know, really, until we ask, and who knows what they are going to have to teach us. So I think one way to find out is to begin by listening to and caring for their stories. And one last, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
you so much Thank for sharing so much. that with us. We have some time for Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Michelle? Yes. Less likely to want to share. Uh, you mean in sort of inviting them to speak? Don't feel comfortable. Yeah, I think, um, let me think. Creating opportunities maybe for them to share in small groups, maybe in pairs, um, rather than in front of a large group would be a place to start. And again, asking you know very simple questions about. Um, Well, you could ask about them about their name. You could ask them just about their lives, about how it's going. And, you know, sometimes you can say, how are you? And people say, fine, thank you. And they move away. <laughs> but there's a, there's a way of asking sometimes that you can communicate, you know, how's it going really. And the other thing is, you know, when you're involved in activities together, so when I was a young pastor, there were certain people in the church that didn't open up very easily. They were not necessarily youth. But it seemed like older men, as, you know, I looked young at the time. And, <laughs> but I, the, I wondered how I would sort of get through. And the way it started to happen was painting Fellowship Hall. Okay, we're doing something together. We're side by side. You know, we're not staring each other in the face, feeling put on the spot. But we're doing something together. And all of a sudden, out comes the stories, right? So I think it may be that the Shire people will share when they're doing something else or just kind of, that's why your, your activities are so important and your, your trips, your mission trips that make them think about, um, you know, their place in the world and other people in the world uh, that open up their minds that way. But I think um, just trying to stay nearby is a good tack. Thanks. Yes. When my boys left for college, and I would ask, how's everything going? And I'd get good. So I changed my tactic, and I would say, so tell me, you know, three things that went well for you this week, or uh -huh. what three things challenged you this week? And I would get, like, these stories, and it was, it was really nice. So instead of just asking how it's going. So you invited them to tell you some stories. Yeah. yeah. And things that were, you know, that were going well and maybe yeah. things that were not going so well, but, you know, not saying the word bad. So what, what bad things happened to you this week? Just what challenged Highs you? Highs and lows. Yeah. Yeah. So. Great. It's a good idea. Anyone else? I'm curious. I find uh, that when young people are willing to share and if there's a chance to kind of be present with them and help them see the neglected evidence or make an unearthed or forgotten connection, that there's that sparkling moment, but then they're gonna to return to a domain where the adult family members or older siblings have much more influence and much more pressure or standing than I do. And so I, I see that in the body language as they have that moment, but then, uh, you know, it's, it's unlearned, it's reinforced. So my question. What are pastoral possibilities for us to follow up working against that dynamic of the immediate nuclear family structure? Well, I mean, I think uh, it would be lovely if you could visit the family with everyone present and maybe have, uh, have a kind of uh, narrative conversation with them where you invite different people in the family to tell their stories. Right. Um, it's tricky. I mean, if it's a crisis, then that might call for another kind of inter intervention. And I did include in the packet a list of some resources and some uh, hotlines, numbers you can call if, if there's a true crisis going on. Um, but I think, you know, um, this whole approach to caring for stories really grew out of the, the family systems um, movement. And so 
anytime you can have conversations with more than one person in the family present, I think it can really be helpful because sometimes like a family has a story, like either, you know, he's the sports one and, and he's the brain. I have heard this many times. People like divide up their kids and they, they're allowed to be one, good at one thing and nothing else, right? And uh, again, I think those are stories that can sometimes get hardened or he's the troublemaker, right? And that we might want to challenge, you know, um, in terms of, you know, well, when are there, what, you know, what are some uh, jobs that this person really does well around the house? Or, you know, what, can you think of a story when, you know, you contributed to the family in, in an important way? So, yeah, it, it is challenging. And sometimes you're caring for both the family and, and the youth entrusted to you. Hi, so I, uh, one more question for me. Um, so I've been in a, a couple of experiences where some kids have enjoyed sharing too much. Yes. Um, not so much as in like too much information, but it's like you, you kind of, you give a microphone to a kid and they just kind of keep going and tell their whole life story. Uh, so what, what are your strategies for remaining pastoral and continuing to let them feel heard while also like wrapping them up and giving other kids a chance. Okay, so if in you're in a group. Well, one of the things I do in my classes, and some of my students are here, uh, will, um, is that at the beginning we make a covenant for how we want to have our conversations together. And the students usually volunteer uh, what those guidelines are going to be, and we write them up and then try, you know, can, can point back to them if something like that comes up. But often in the, in the covenant there is um, an idea that people do want, uh, they don't want one person to dominate the entire discussion. So it's like if you're someone who is outgoing and, and talks a lot, you might want to move back a little bit. And if you're someone who's shy and for whom it's hard to speak, you might want to try to move forward, you know, into the conversation. And sometimes just saying that or, you know, giving a reminder, uh, sometimes you can say, thank you, and let's make space for, for another person to share. And I know it's hard to interrupt, right? Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. You. <laughs> oh, what I was going to say is that the person um, who likes to talk a lot, and then there's the shy person, maybe there's a way you can break it up and say, okay, um, the rest of the discussion, maybe you could print it out or something and we can get back to that at the next session so that they're totally being heard but just not right at that moment. Uh huh. Because everybody wants to be heard. Yes. And, but at the end of the day, you want to play fair. You know what uh -huh. I mean? So yeah. it might be something very important that they're saying, but um, we can get back to it because we're going to have another session and you yeah. can break it up into two parts. Or we can talk more afterwards. <laughs> But yeah. we, you know, just being honest with the whole group, it's like, this is our decision. We want to make space for, for everyone. Yeah. And with the time, one of the classes that I learned here, one of this whole time management and they have, everybody has such an important life, but someone is very, very important, but not, may not be addressing it or saying it and be in such pain that yes. they, you have, you have to adjust your schedule or have them do it at a later date because it, it's a life situation. It really uh -huh. is. And I okay. saw that in that class. The teacher um, didn't want to offend the guy in the class, but he noticed that he was not his normal self. Mm -hmm. So he had to break his schedule and hang around when everybody was leaving to, so he wouldn't embarrass the child. Yes. And when he went to see the child one-on-one, -on -one, he says, I noticed that you weren't your normal self. The kid just broke down and started crying. And then he told his story and he had to minister to the child. He had to break his schedule to yeah. save that, and that probably saved the kid's life, you know what I mean? Because Absolutely. Because he was very, very Absolutely. distressed. So, anyway. so I think noticing when someone is not their usual self, you know, um, is really an important thing to keep in mind. And I thank you for that.
Well, if there's nothing else, uh, yes? Okay. <laughs> Something that I've noticed, um, I've, I'm in the process of setting up several uh, little youth ministry groups in various communities, and one thing that I'm seeing a consistent trend in, as I walk into a community that I'm really not familiar with, um, and, and if I am with the youth, um, one of the first things I've said is, you know, I've applauded their willingness of the youth to step forward and participate in the group. And typically what I'll say is, as le you know, I'd, although I don't know you individually yet, I do know that you are each leaders in your community and you have stepped forward to take on this important role of piloting this program. And the, the body language, I mean, this is almost, I wish I did like a graph or a study of it, but the body language of the youth simply by me l labeling them in an affirmative way is unbelievable and these kids have come back as taking on that role seriously because somebody, some random person, came up and said that they were a leader and an important member of, wow. of their community. Um, that has been teaching, I mean, I think I've known that all along, mm -hmm. but seeing just that, that little one sentence, how powerful it is in motivating these young people towards excellence, um, has truly inspired me to try to be more conscious of how I um, invite those, those stories mm -hmm. in your words. Um, it, it's just been very powerful to see them transform and really take on the role that, that I've called forth, so to speak, uh -huh. in them. Thank you. That's really helpful. It's a great example. You know, the, abil the ability to call forth. And you might not know in the moment how important what you say is. But sometimes, you know, 10 years later, you'll find out. Someone will send you a note. Or um, you'll see, you know, one of, one of your former youth group members, you know, really uh, kind of going for it in life and being a leader. So thank you so much. That's a great example. Yes. It just was the uh, anniversary of the Challenger disaster, uh -huh. and the famous um, that um, Krista McAuliffe said was, I touch the future, I teach, and that you never know. I mean, I think that was, there's something really struck me when it happened, you know, uh -huh. that, um, and something I've carried with me, and I've had, I've, I'm old enough that people have come back and said, remember you said to me you uh -huh. were a good writer? And I'm, said, I'm glad I did, but you don't remember. <laughs> but yeah, right, right. But yeah, you don't remember, but they do remember. They do, they do. Thank you. It's a beautiful memory. Folks, I think that wraps up our time for today. Can we give Dr. Michelle one more round of applause? You're very kind. Appreciate your kindness.